Thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes designed for creative people to learn new skills, explore their passions, and get inspired. These classes are designed for real life so you can expand the skills you're looking for to get stuck into your dream projects, express your ideas, and connect with a broad creative community. As a user of After Effects and someone who's constantly looking to do more and more with the program, I've been exploring this a lot over at Skillshare and last month learned how to animate characters with Jake Bartlett's character rigging with Duick Basil course, in which I made a driver and learned how to rig them up and animate them cleanly. And now that's in my arsenal. To get access to courses like this with no ads, it's less than $10 a month with an annual subscription. But for a limited time, you can use the link in my description to get a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership. So click this link below and get started. During the Italian Grand Prix, due to a poor start, Valtteri Bottas found himself further down the field than usual, following a bunch of midfield cars that the Mercedes had been about a second quicker than in qualifying. It should have been easy picking for Bottas, but he was unable to make progress, partly due to issues with his Mercedes overheating. The car's cooling was insufficient in race traffic, a position the team isn't usually too troubled with. So why do F1 cars need good cooling? How do they stay cool? And why did Mercedes suffer more than others in Italy? Let's start with the why. There are many examples. It may not surprise you to know that power units in F1 can get very, very hot. The internal combustion engine, the ICE, literally explodes petrol inside it, and there are lots of moving mechanical parts rubbing against each other very, very fast, creating heat by friction. Dramatically heating up car components causes them to change shape, particularly metal elements which are very susceptible to thermal expansion, literally growing bigger in size as they get warmed. With the very specifically designed shapes of the components inside F1 cars and the way they are packed tightly together, Overheating these parts causes them to distort, wear down at the structurally fragile parts like the joints and bolts, push against each other and many many things that cause parts to wear through their life and cause reliability issues. The turbo spins at incredible speeds, compressing and charging air with energy that can heat it up to hundreds of degrees instead of the tens of degrees it needs cooling down to before returning to the engine. The hybrid part of the powertrain, the MGUs, the battery in particular, also get very hot, though not as hot as the ICE. You might have noticed how a smartphone can get very hot when used intensively, or if you've ever had the juddering horrible misfortune of using a MacBook Pro, you'll know exactly how bad electronics can get if not cooled properly. Electronics and the whole powertrain will have a noticeable drop in performance if everything gets too hot, so all in all, for performance and, most importantly, reliability, you need to make sure everything is adequately cooled as it gets to work. But with the power unit constantly producing heat, how do you keep everything cool? Fans of the second law of thermodynamics will know that, in simple terms, if you put a hot thing next to a cold thing, heat will move from the hot thing into the cold thing. This cools the hot thing down and warms the cold thing up, and eventually they will be the same temperature. So if you've got a hot engine, you need to get it to output all its heat into something cold and then move that thing away from the car. In doing that, you've taken the heat away and kept the engine cool. And the main way to do this is with pumped liquid. This could be oil, water, or a special solution to suit the particular system, but it essentially works like this. So the engine is constantly producing heat that needs to be dumped. A pump pushes cool liquid through pipes and tubes that run through the engine. As the cool liquid runs through the engine, heat moves from the engine into the liquid, heating it up. The liquid, now hot, is moved away from the engine and into a radiator. We now want to dump the heat into the air, which will disappear out and away from the car. To do this, the radiator is normally a large shape with lots of folds and a complicated surface. Why? Because it increases its surface area. Let's imagine a sphere for a moment. Say the sphere is full of very hot water and is sitting in cold air. The heat has to transfer from the hot water to the cold air through the surface area of the sphere. This area limits how quickly the heat can pass from one to the other. But if we make the sphere all bumpy and lumpy, the surface area is now much bigger and we can dump the heat into the air much faster. Such is the story with radiators and all manner of cooling systems found in engines. Now the radiator doesn't just radiate heat energy into the full speed 300km an hour wind rushing over the car. 
the air doesn't just plough through the air intake and out the back of the car like it's a big tunnel. The air actually needs to be slowed down so there's enough time for the heat to transfer into the air particles as they travel past. So every air intake leads to a clever system of ducts that slow the air down and take that moving air around the various cooling systems around the car. The engine, the MGUs, the battery and other various components may all have different cooling systems located in different parts of the car, each with different sizes and with different fluids inside. Some with pumps powered electrically and some driven by the engine itself. The hot air is then dumped out of the car. A lot of it goes straight out of the back of the chassis, that massive opening at the back of the side pods, but they are also allowed to vent it through a small slit at the bottom of the side pods and through outlets at the top of the side pods near the driver. Other than that, the side pods basically have to be a solid surface. Most of the cooling devices are mounted in the side pods and above the engine, with it up to the designers how they want to deal with the trade-off of space, weight and packaging. If you want to keep the side pods tighter and smaller, you might move more cooling above the engine but this affects the centre of mass and will block more of the air headed for the rear wing. The tight, shrink wrap shapes of F1 cars these days likely indicate just how that team has gone about its cooling. But as with all things in F1, cooling comes with costs, and finding the balance and the compromise is all part of design, setup and tweaking. Ideally, of course, F1 wouldn't have these massive holes in them. They'd be smooth, closed surfaces that work the airflow for downforce or slip through the air like a knife through soup. Gulping up air and slowing it down for cooling slow the car down. It creates drag. Larger coolers take up weight and space which can slow the car down and restrict optimum chassis design. So when it comes to cooling you want to do as little of it as you can get away with. Different events will have different cooling requirements which will affect different components independently. The local climate and ambient temperature, that is the temperature of the air, is just one part of this equation. Obviously the cooler the air, the easier it will be to transfer heat from the car into it. But there are other factors too. Does the track have long straights? Does it need a lot of power from the engine? Will the MGU units be pushed to the limit? Questions like this will affect your cooling setup in terms of trade-off with performance and reliability. And another factor to consider is whether you're likely to be stuck behind cars for a significant amount of time. Clean air is good. If there's no traffic ahead, you're getting the cool air from the atmosphere in a reliable way. If you're behind another car, you're not in this nice cold air you can use for cooling. You're wading through all the hot air they've just dumped out of their own cooling system. And you can't cool your own car efficiently if the air you're trying to dump heat into is already hot. So your car now continues to build up heat to levels that will cause problems. So you have to drive differently, under the limit, moving to areas of the track you don't want to be in. Unless your design bears in mind you might be fighting in a train of traffic for a decent part of the race. Mercedes likely don't design or set up their cars with this much in mind. They often aren't in traffic or dirty air for very long because they're so fast. And if they are, it's normally in lap traffic that will move out of the way. So when Bottas was suddenly behind six unyielding competitors, his car suffered and didn't like it. His power unit was full throttle for much of the lap and the cooling systems Merck gave him weren't prepared for him to be trapped in a bunch of hot air lap after lap after lap. Now Hamilton also suffered, but he did appear to overcome it better, partly through skill and partly due to being up against slower cars after he was dropped to the back of the field. Cooling design remains an essential skill in F1, in design, in setup and in racecraft, and hopefully this video has given a little insight into a mostly invisible part of Formula 1.